right. Uh, here's another email that I got from Victor because this, I, I saw this the other day. I've just been thinking of, we've been telling some riot stories, some arrest stories, some legal entanglement stories. And then somebody tweeted the Ox Baker Cleveland riot the other day. And I retweeted that. And I had seen this email and I, it just tickled me for a couple of things because everybody now is, I guess they're acting like this is so, this is such unheard of stuff. And this is in a galaxy far, far away that people used to take this shit seriously. It wasn't all that long ago. It just, it just seems like it for people that have never seen it. Um, but Victor says, cause this is an angle we didn't cover before in case you wonder where I'm going with this. Victor says, after all the stories of riots and fans attacking wrestlers you've told, I don't remember hearing you discuss whether baby faces would break kayfabe in these instances and help the heels in a real fight. Can you elaborate? And this is actually, uh, I think we may have told this a long time ago, but this used to be a thing that the baby faces would do if they could, if they were in a position to, without exposing the business, when the heels would be trapped in the ring or the fans would be, you know, advancing. They, you know, cause the thing is the heels had the, you, you always had the advantage when you were in the ring, uh, because of the fact that you've seen it a million times on the video clips and just, you know, on celebrities or guests or whatever, most people cannot smoothly get into a fucking wrestling ring especially if they've been drinking, especially if they're mad. So you've got an advantage. If you're already in the ring, they try to come in. You can usually catch them coming through the ropes. And that's the first thing that you're told. Catch them coming through the ropes. And especially when their foot, their face is very near where you can fucking football kick and you got them, right? When they get in, then it's a little touchier. Um, but what the, when the heels were trapped, people were all around the ring they couldn't get out. Maybe they didn't trust security. Security wasn't there or security was, had turned on them too. All of those things has happened. A lot of times what baby faces would do, maybe not even the ones that were in that match. Maybe the reason why the fans are so hot is because that baby face is fucking down and has been hurt and can't do anything. Other baby faces would sometimes run and hit the ring and start fighting the heels and f what they, they used to term it, fight them back, fight them back to the locker room. Because the theory was the reason why the fans are about to attack is because the heels have gotten away with something. There's nobody to stop them. But if here comes their hero and gets on the fucking heel and they start fighting and moving at the same time, as long as that baby face is right on top of that fucker and peppering him and boom, boom, boom. And they're the fans will actually, I've seen it happen the fans would separate and let the, they were going to kill this guy a minute ago, but now that fucking Fargo's got him. Okay. And yeah, and they're cheering and the baby face would literally working fight the heel back to the locker room. So the people wouldn't knife him or kill him. Um, but that only worked if the baby faces were happened to be watching or could be alerted. And Ricky Morton's told a bunch of stories. There was times they couldn't help us because they had to be down. Because, you know, where was one night Ricky was laying in the ring in Biloxi, he tells this story, and Robert was laying in the ring. We'd done whatever, and as soon as we hit the floor, people started emptying out of ringside, and the, the big guy, Bobby, face-locked, front face-locked, and tried to hold him down, and the guy just stood up underneath Bobby Eaton and had him swinging around. Ricky Morton's laying there supposedly unconscious with one eye open watching us get the shit kicked out of us because, you know, he can't get up. Watts would have fired him. Um, but you see in the, in that Ox Baker clip, just anybody that hadn't seen it, YouTube Ox Baker Cleveland riot, um, Ox and Johnny powers had just turned heel on Ernie lad. Right. And Ox That's and right. yeah. powers are kicking the shit out of Ernie lad, downtown Cleveland, predominantly black audience, nobody able to help. And you see this was, well, let me just add, what? it's not just kicking the shit out of them. Ox Baker, by this point in time, had been established as killing wrestlers with his heart punch. Well, true. Okay. So, I mean, he's hitting Ernie Ladd over and over with the heart punch. So the fans aren't just reacting to the baby face getting beat up. They're reacting to the idea he could die. Yeah. yeah well, and, and legitimately, not due to the heart punch, but just due to freak happenstance, two guys had had heart attacks and died after matches with 
Ox Baker, and and that's the way they marketed the Heart Punch. Within and a so, year, and yeah, within a year, and and Ernie Ladd also is six nine three twenty five, and he's selling it. He's quivering, and he's selling, and he's down, and he's hurting. And so anyway, it, a lot of the riots were not captured on film or tape because they were house shows predominantly. You know, TV was a different atmosphere. You didn't get as much heat, and there was more in the way of of them to get to you. Uh, but this just happened to be, and you see first the chairs flying and then people start coming in the ring with it. Cause there, there's so many of them and it's from all four sides. The cops are overwhelmed. The cops made a mistake there when you watch this tape and that they didn't really get in the ring because they were trying to keep, they were on the floor trying to keep the people from getting in the ring and you see them spraying mace and you see it and you can watch every corner. Something else is going on. Somebody's getting nightstick. There's mace being sprayed. But anyway, it was it was chaos, and and I've I've told that story, and people retweeted it. Uh, they either they either retweeted Ernie's quote or Ox's quote, because I asked Ernie about it himself. I'd already seen the footage. I said Ernie, and he told me the story. He said, "I told him, I said Ox, I'm laying there. Ox, the natives are getting restless." And Ox had that voice too. Just a little more heat, Ernie. And he hit him with another heat punch. Ox, the natives are getting restless. Just a little more heat, Ernie. And then here came the chairs flying and the fucking people in the ring. And, and finally, Ernie just goes and rolls and sells over under the ropes. But Bulldog Brower came and hit the ring and fucking jumped Johnny Powers and was able to fight him down to the floor. And then Powers said, fuck it, and was goddamn just panicking and just ran. Broken Field ran, over, not even back to the locker room the right way, but to an opening at the end of the arena that he saw around the hockey plexiglass. And Ox follows right after him, but Ox was not nearly as fleet of foot as Johnny Powers. And right as he's going over that fucking plexiglass thing, a fan comes with a chair from the back and just crowns Ox Baker with it, left a crease in his fucking head he had for the rest of his life. But in Mid-South Wrestling, it wasn't, the the baby faces wouldn't help because there was a heck of a baby face crew that, you know, if if you were in a fight, in Mid-South Wrestling, Hacksaw Duggan and Dr. Death when he was a babyface, but the heels, part of the the kind of understanding that the heels had in Mid-South Wrestling was that not only would everybody stay till the end, well, Watts made you stay till the end of the show anyway. You may be needed for a pull apart. You may be, it was just more professional. The underneath guys he felt ought to be watching the main events because that's where they want to be. So you, you were supposed to stay uh, at the show until the last match was over, but the heels had an agreement that they would all watch the last matches after they were done because many times the heels would come and help us. And especially Buddy Landell, when we first got there, he would ride with me in the, the midnights and he'd be on earlier and then he'd get dressed real quick and then he'd watch our match. And the first time we had a fucking deal in Baton Rouge before Dundee even got involved in that other thing I told you about. It was the first time we wrestled Magnum TA in wrestling too. It was like the middle of January of 84. And we had only done like, I think one or two underneath matches in Baton Rouge. So we didn't realize how they could get. And, and for the first couple of weeks until this night, Dennis Condry carried the tennis racket back from the ring. That was what he had, had decided on when we first got to Louisiana. He said, because, you know, especially with the people, the way they were, and you don't know where the cops are good or not. So what we agreed on was, Soon as we hit the floor after the match, he would take the tennis racket and he'd go first. I needed to put my hands on his shoulders and stay behind him, and Bobby would be behind me because most of the people would be after me, right? And the cops are going to be in front of us and back of us, on the side of us, wherever, but that's our unit. Well, goddamn, <clears throat> I did have the racket loaded. The early loading of the racket was not a horseshoe. I got to 10 snips and an aluminum cookie sheet or two and cut a tennis racket shaped piece out and put a dog choker chain around the edge of it so it had some weight in the in the rough towns and i had it that night and that was our first time with two and ta there and i said well i'm just going to take this and we'll see what happens so we hit the floor and dennis has got the racket and we get about five feet and somebody just fucking nails him right in the jaw and fucking, he took him a second. He had to shake his head. And they're coming for Bobby in the back. And now I didn't want to be completely unarmed. So I'd had a fucking thing, a mace, that I put in the inside pocket of my coat. I figured, well, this might help me, you know, in a, in a tight situation. 
I didn't know I was only going to have it for a fucking week. This whole thing broke down. As soon as the guy punched Dennis in the face and he had to fucking shake his head for a second, Buddy Landell had seen it. And he starts running from the back of the centroplex down the aisle way. Well, meanwhile, the guy hit Dennis. Now he's going to run because he didn't want Dennis to hit him with the racket. He turns around and starts running. Buddy Landell, excuse me, pardon me, broken field ran his way around the fans and tackled that fucking guy. And Dennis was right there at that point and fucking came overhand over the top, down on top of the guy's head with that racket. And I, that's when I was using wooden rackets broke the racket, the frame, and it bent the cookie sheets in the shape of like a fucking cooking pot right over the top of this guy's head. And uh, anyway, a guy had got Bobby in the back and I'd got, and now all the cops are going in two different directions and I'm by myself. And this guy fucking came up and reached out like he was going to do something. And I snatched him by the fucking collar and stuck the goddamn mace up in his face. I said, I will make you wish you've never been born. And he fucking, t and I'm running to the back now. Bobby's got back to the, he's running to the back. The cops have got with us and the people try to glom in and somebody fucking hit me from the side and I almost went down and the fucking mace went flying. I was like, God damn it. The only gimmick I ever lost in the fucking people. And we finally got in the back and Dennis hands me my racket back and it looked like, it looked like a baseball cap. The handle of the racket looked like the, the bill and it looked like a baseball cap that he'd set over. And the cops had drugged the guy out. He was unconscious, but they didn't even fucking bother us about that because they saw him hit the guy, hit Dennis first. But that's when Dennis said, Corny, you carry the racket from now on because I'm going to kill somebody. And I don't want to go to jail. So that's how I started carrying the racket after the match. And I never did find the mace. Did you ever have any problems buying the racket? Or you go into a store and the guy's like, I know who you are. I know what you're <laughs> going to do with this racket. <laughs> no, you know what? Honestly, no. Never did. Because back then, you could go into a sporting goods store. You'd go into Walmart and buy one of those things for $30 with the zippered vinyl uh, sleeve or case or whatever cover on the, on the cover itself, but with the bare handle. 30 bucks. I went through them. I just throw them away when they got bent and fucked up. And now you can't find brand new, at least you can find them in like flea markets, old ones, but you can't find those kind of covers on rackets anymore. They either sell them naked or they sell them with the whole carrying case with a shoulder strap and everything. And the cover on those is what made the noise. So I'd have been out of business if it was today, but no, nobody ever, they looked at me sideways when I went into the mall in Shreveport to buy the women's shoes and dress and wig that I wore on that angle where I came in and hit Riggy Morton in the head with my purse with a brick in it, but they weren't looking at me sideways because they knew who I was. I tried to tell them I was in a college play. I don't think they bought it. Anyway, that's what, uh, that's what happened there. <laughs> Could Buddy fight? Are you out of your fucking mind? He got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, I know not, that. But <laughs> well, not only, not only could he, but he would. Um, I mean, he's not, see, that was the thing if buddy as, as Butch Reed's sidekick, it was funny. Cause buddy just had to act like buddy. Um, cause buddy in, as he used to say, uh, I'm an international yacht broker from Toulon, France, not some local yokel working at the Alexandria Kmart. He knocked the shit out of the average guy on the street, but he was in the locker room with Butch Reed and JYD and Hacksaw Duggan and Dr. Death. And so he was, he was more entertaining and friendlier and less abrasive as he would have been otherwise in other locker rooms at that point in time. But yeah, he'd knock your fucking dick stiff if, uh, if it came to it. It is sometimes with his working punches. Um, but you know what the problem was, I think, uh, with the people in Louisiana that tried to beat us up and, and kill us What's lack of a good breakfast. That'll do it. Lack of a good breakfast will make you grumpy every time, folks. That's why, and that's another reason why me and the great Brian Last are so giddy and happy today because we're on the Magic Spoon. The Magic Spoon, the best dad gum cereal in the world. The kids will eat this like candy, but it's good for them. You'll eat it like snacks, but it's good for you. You don't even need, need to use the milk. I have cut down my milk participation by just eating this stuff like popcorn. Milk participation? My milk participation. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can be lactose intolerant. 
That's right. And I figure I'm, I don't know that I am, but I'm intolerant of most everything else. So lactose <laughs> might very well be in there. But folks, if it's your new year's resolution to eat better, to cut out the sugar and the junk and, and cut down on the carbs and the unhealthy food, magic spoon, start your day off right, or get the kids off to school where you can start drinking your wine in the morning mothers. Uh, zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, three net grams of carbs in each serving. You know what all those numbers mean? That means it tastes good, but it won't make you fat. And so many of you have asked, you can build your very own custom variety box. You don't have to get just a shitload of one of the delicious flavors. You can get all of them. You can make your own boxes. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, blueberry, peanut butter, cinnamon. Honestly, it tastes too good to be true, but it is. And it tastes too good to be free, but it is. Gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, GMO-free, just not money-free. You got to pay for it, but you'll love to do so. Go to magicspoon.com slash J-I-M. Grab a variety pack and try it today and use the promo code JIM at checkout. Save $5 off your order of the variety packs and remember if you don't like it there's something wrong with you but if you don't like it for any reason they're going to give you your money back and not ask any questions they will not grill you they'll not put you through the ringer about it they'll just send you back your money and question your taste magicspoon.com slash jim and use the code jim to save five dollars off 